Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I have a great pleasure to talk with female entrepreneur Asha from Kuala Lumpur. Sure, thank you, Ed. Thank you for um, inviting me uh, to have this interview with you. And I'm very, very honored and privileged to be part of the community. Mm -hmm. So to um, briefly introduce myself, I was born and um, I grew up in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Um, and I come from a very conservative, orthodox, traditional family. By religion, I'm a Hindu, and uh, I'm the third generation here in Malaysia, but my uh, family roots are back in Kerala, a state down south India. I grew up being a rebel, a rebel girl, literally. So when someone tells me not to do something, that's exactly what I want to do because I don't just take no for an answer, you know. So my parents had a, a very tough time, you know, uh, in terms of disciplining me. But I'm still, I, I still consider myself to be a, a good kid growing up because um, I never really got into any massive, you know, problems or troubles, you know. But uh, I, I used to challenge the status quo. Um, so no one in my family had actually... Um, experience being a cabin crew so when i completed my high school and i told my dad um, that i wanted to travel and go around and see the world and he said well i don't have i don't have the money to go and you know sponsor you to go and travel around the world i said i'm not asking for your money but i am saying that i want to take up a job that allows me to travel and he paused and uh kind of also you know, I, I, could, I could see that he was kind of thinking about it. He was pondering. There was a lot of questions that, you know, was popping through his mind. What would my relatives say? What would, you know, the society think? My daughter wants, you know, to be a cabin crew, which is when it's translated, he came back to me and said, why would you want to be a high class waitress? You know, that's literally how he saw it. But, uh, to me, I did not see it that way. You know, being a cabin crew gave me um, a very, very different exposure because I am out there, I'm putting myself out there. The safety of my passengers, you know, they're trusting me with literally their lives, right? And I get to experience going around different places, different countries, you know, experiencing different culture, getting acquainted to different cultural nuances, um, and that was such an amazing, enriching experience for me. At the age of 18, I left home. I took up the job as a cabin crew. I flew around for about just under four years. Uh, and I was very conscious that I didn't want to do that as a career per se. So I just wanted to gain the experience to go around and, and really open my uh, perception and, you know, this worldview, you know, to see the world, to know what is it like uh, to be living in different countries and experiencing local cultures, right? So that was an important experience that I gained from being in the airlines. Um, and I consciously decided after leaving the airlines that I wanted to get into human resources because I really enjoyed the human interaction. Don't ask me why. Uh, and, and really taking people's problem and, and trying to find a solution for them. So as you know, you've been in HR, uh, we are the first, you know, people or the first person, uh, a new employer, new hire meets, and the last person to say goodbye, right? And uh, it's, it's always that, um, that that's, that's a very intricate balance that you have to strike because you have to be the uh, conduit between the management and the employee. So I fell in love with the, with the, with the whole scope of, of being in HR. Um, and I really had the chance to start from um, right at the bottom, doing the nitty gritties of HR and slowly working my way up, um, you know, to holding more strategic and leadership roles in HR. But I also did take a detour uh, after about seven years in HR. Um, I, w I, d I completed, a, while I was working, I completed my first degree in human resource management. Uh, with, you know, the local university. And, and in the last decade or so, um, holding more senior positions in, in multinational companies uh, and managing different markets in um, Asia-Pacific region. 
So my last position before I decided to quit the, or rather exit from the corporate world, I was the uh, senior HR director for a uh, Australian you know, company that deals with, it's an online e-commerce, uh, online digital platform uh, in real estate, um, Pacific uh, countries. Um, I just felt that uh, the universe had given me an opportunity to really become an entrepreneur. So the events that, the, the, <laughs> that, that transpired prior to me having this, um, this moment, like this aha moment, was just before I reached a burnt out, you know, I was completely burnt out, right? So just before hitting the burnout uh, stage, I had this aha moment that I wanted to really start something by myself and make a larger or, a, you know, a bigger impact, not just by channeling my passion to one particular organization, but literally spreading my wings and, and reaching out and making um, an impact to uh, many more organizations. So I bit the bullet, or rather, you know, as they say, you know, I took the, the um, uh, bull by the horns and decided to launch myself as an entrepreneur. And I started my consulting, HR and legal consulting business early 2018. And that's where the birth of uh, AM Talent Partners, so AM is actually my initials, uh, Asha Menon. So AM Talent Partners uh, was born. And so today what I do is um, consulting is my, is my bread and butter. It's the core uh, to what I do. Uh, in addition to consulting, I am very much uh, a women empowerment enthusiast. Um, Basically, from my personal journey, um, I have so much to share, so much to give. Um, and I think, you know, even if I could make um, an impact to one woman's life, that is so rich, so fulfilling to me. Mm -hmm. So I run by, you know, it's a passion project. It's not for profit or it's not really ge uh, revenue generating for me. I run two passion projects uh, simultaneously. Uh, as I'm, I'm doing my consulting business. One is I formed, oh, I, I, I'm the founder of uh, Finding Your Mojo Retreats, Women Retreats. Uh, basically, Finding Your Mojo is literally getting people to, especially women, uh, to discover their passion or their ikigai. You know, it's a Japanese concept. Um, you know, and, and helping them discover their ikigai so that they can um, take charge of life and live more meaningfully. And um, I think most of the time people would always ask you, um, you know, like, are you wealthy? Are you, you know, are you healthy? Are you wealthy? You know, but nobody really asks you, are you happy? You know, uh, I find that to be very, very rare. People kind of posing that question and asking, you know, are you happy? So I think if you're really living a, a life that is, driven by purpose and you know your why your ikigai that in itself you know um would help maneuver you to lead a more conscious meaningful and happy life so that's one that's finding a mojo retreats is one and i also have a platform that i created it's called snapback like literally snapping back snapback um, this platform uh, was created for uh, two categories of women in particular. One, women who are survivors of domestic violence and, and sexual abuse or any kind of abuse. Um, and two, the second category is single mothers who are relying on um, external support or you know, external aid, like either they are depending on relatives or uh, local communities or government funded, you know, um, any kind of external help. So what, plat uh, what Snap Snapback does is Snapback helps them to gain financial independence. So using my HR and legal skills, um, I would help them to prepare a CV. Um, I also help them to uh, become more employable. So we do uh, prepare them for interview skills, some basic Microsoft, you know, Word, Excel, PowerPoint uh, training, 
Um, also, if they are experiencing trauma, then we get volunteers who are competent to, to talk to them. So that's literally, you know, um, what I've started. But obviously, it has all halted a little bit because the idea is to create uh, or rather to build this mobile app so that it's accessible, but um, due to some challenges with funding. Um, so we've parked that aside right now. And um, I hope that, you know, I would be able to pick that up um, and, and continue that course uh, so that I'm able to reach out and uh, help many more women to change their destiny. 75% of employees are not happy. So as I a, think it's even more. <laughs> uh, as an HR specialist, can you give us the uh, uh, can you give us the reason why is that the case? What's going on? Why with all these HR tools we have today, we have a data, we have everything. Why so many people are not happy? That's pretty much a very apt question right now, Ed. Because if you look at um, what's happening currently in the corporate world, uh, and having been in that space, and and now that I'm actually I've come out from the corporate world and I've got a better view, you know, I can see I've got a macro view across what's happening and I appreciate things better. Um, uh, there are two things that I'd like to highlight here. One is that if you look at um, the amount of awareness that we're trying to raise in terms of mental health, right, it is increasing. Why? Because there is a real problem with the depression, with um, employees being unhappy and as a result uh, to that unhappiness, they get depressed. The number of uh, suicide cases are also increasing. I know Japan, like, you know, that suicide cases are so high. And similarly, I think in this side of the world as well, the numbers are increasing by the day, which is really, really concerning. And, you know, it's ringing all bells for me. Um, so when you look at why is this causing, you know, there's so many uh, reasons that we can actually try and, um, uh, and, and put a finger to, but there is no one particular reason. I think, you know, it's a spiral effect, right? You, know, you touch on one, you know, it has got, you know, effects on, on other areas as well. So companies or other organizations um, are running a business. And everybody from the senior management right up to, you know, the, the blue collar workers, um, they are working to achieve one common goal. If you ask me what it is, is it employee wellness? Obviously not, right? It's all about the numbers. It's all about the profits. It's all about the numbers, you know, especially with what's happening, you know, with the economic um, uh, landscape right now. Uh, Everybody is so pressured to making sure that there is enough reserves, you know, for a rainy day. And hence, it's very numbers driven. Very small um, number of organizations that actually cares truly about employees' happiness. I know being in the HR space, and I would not want to name you know organizations, but some companies would do employee engagement surveys or employee satisfaction surveys just so that they would tick the boxes. But if you really ask me, what is it that they're trying to achieve? What is the objective of doing that? engagement survey right because if there is no follow-up action what's the point it defeats the whole purpose right but just so that they say that okay you know we are ticking boxes yes we kind of do a uh, engagement service but when you speak to hr people and then you kind of really dig deeper and try to understand um do they even analyze the data that you know that they gain from <laughs> the survey results Right. They would say, oh, yeah, we do focus groups. Um, we would uh, look at the data and then we will try to implement some of the things that we think it's doable. Um, to be very honest with you, I'm not an advocate for employee engagement service at all. I think the whole concept is so flawed, if you ask me. Because if you really look at um, performance management or productivity, right, or, or management performance itself, there is always this bell curve, mm -hmm. right? And um, if you look at the bell curve in itself, the mass is actually sitting on the average scale. So you have perhaps, you know, 60 to 70% of your employees who are between like on a scale from one to five would be between the three to 3.5, right? And then you have your superstars or your high performers 
probably a small percentage, maybe five, six percent, maybe ten percent if you're lucky, right? And you have the, the laggards, you know, always maybe another five, ten percent, right? So if you are basing your action plan on what majority is saying, which is basically your, your average performance, right? Not what your high performers are actually saying. So the question is whether is it really worth the investment to look at what your average employees want and focus on that. You know, I don't believe in a one size fit all approach to um, uh, retaining employees. I always like to customize my solutions and my approach to the different clusters of employees, right? So you probably can look at maybe implementing certain things for your average employees because you need them as well, right? But you want to go that extra mile and make sure that your high performers are also taken care of because they are high achievers, mm -hmm. their drive is so high, you want to be able to cater for that as well, right? But when it comes to unhappiness, you know, um, in terms of why depression is kicking in and we see a lot of um, cases these days, you know, in fact, people don't want to talk about depression. It's so much so it's like a taboo, you know, they're so scared that if they were to uh, be diagnosed with depression, they might even lose their jobs today, right? So that is a real issue. But um, to answer your question, I think, you know, um, I really believe that if an organization were to truly care for uh, its employees, right? Um, and having that heart-centered approach in, in um, coming up with your core values, coming up with your vision and your mission statements and your employee value propositions, that's what really makes a difference. And I think those uh, employers or organizations would go a long way to, um, to keeping or retaining the best talents in today's market. How you and your service and your business might help companies or might help employees or you are helping both sides to create an uh, economy of happiness in the future? Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, so what I am actually offering, or rather the services that I provide, um, I have literally stepped away from the traditional HR consulting services. Uh, I think that one is a no-brainer. Anybody can actually provide that services. Um, and I think my um, unique selling propositions uh, would be, um, I, so I specialize today, I specialize in innovative HR. Uh, what innovative HR is all about is, is connecting people um, to the organization's purpose and aligning that organization's purpose to individual purpose. I know that's a mouthful, but, um, but I truly believe that um, today, if your employee resonates and connects with the organization's purpose, and is able to align that organization's purpose to an individual purpose, literally the employee will not be performing or delivering from an employee's capacity. What happens then is, is there is a shift. The shift takes place in the mindset. And now the employee becomes an entrepreneur. And when you are an entrepreneur, you treat the business and the company as if that is your own baby, right? You take more ownership, you take more accountability, and you would walk that extra 10 miles to make sure that your customers are happy. Happy employees results in happy customers. So Actually, yeah. that mm -hmm. is basically what I'm trying to offer and trying to help companies to bridge that gap between creating that purpose. And the purpose is not, doesn't necessarily have to be commercially valued purpose. It has to be something that is driven organically and authentically, right? And only then, as you know, when you look at the workforce uh, demographics, today, baby boomers are winning off. You, you know, you have a very small percentage of baby boomers in the, in the um, working population now. And then you look at your millennials, which is basically people like you and me, right? Um, we're there. We're kind of like, you know, and, and if you look at not 
all millennials are, are high aspirational uh, millennials. They're not very ambitious. So after probably you reach 35 years and above, uh, your priorities changes in life, where you want to start a family, you want to um, uh, look into job security and stability, and you really, you know, you want to have a job just to keep the bills going, uh, but you're not really driven to, um, to aspire or to be ambitious anymore. I'm talking, I'm generalizing it, but this is exactly what's happening in, in the market right now. And obviously now, as you see, majority of your workforce is basically your Gen Ys, right? Um, and, and with Gen Ys, the, the younger generation, Gen Ys, Gen Z, um, it's a very different ball game altogether in terms of how you engage with them, how you interact with them, how you are making an impact, you know, and so that they are able to make an impact, you know, and it doesn't have to be just financial impact, it has to be social impact. Like they want to go out and make a social impact. That's a big thing now. And if you see a lot of youngsters these days, um, which is, a, a, which is a, a good thing, I have to say. So the, the spiritual awakening is happening at a, at a much more earlier stage in comparison to people, you know, in our era, right? It took us like, you know, um, I think I, I had my awakening to my spiritual path not long ago, I think probably about two or two and a half years ago, you know. Um, so, but right now, uh, because of uh, the amount of resources that we have available right now, um, the younger generation um, are getting really um, into the spiritual connection and they want to be able to go out there and make a social impact or even um, go and create this, this, this change or uh, have a ripple effect of that change, right? So, um, with connect i mean I'm kind of really trying to advocate this this value propositions for organizations um most of the time i'm not successful because they kind of don't see it um so i'm actually building this model of hr innovative trying to uh, embed concepts like um design thinking you know design thinking how can hr practitioners embrace design thinking and change the way we operate as hr practitioners today right so design thinking, when I talk about design thinking, first thing that comes to mind, people will always tell me that, oh, I'm not a creative person. I am not good in art. I don't know how to draw. I can't draw for nuts. But design thinking has got nothing to do with that. Though it originates from the D school back in States, right? Um, and, and Tim Brown, the CEO, um, you know, he was pretty much the driving force of design thinking. Um, and it was used by graphic designers, you know, uh, originally. But if you ask me, companies like, uh, for, for example, companies like um, Apple, you know, since day one, when they started, they've already started applying design thinking. Albert Einstein, he started talking about design thinking, may not have used that term design thinking, but the concepts, the fundamentals, the principles were all the same. So design thinking is pretty much about a mindset. You mentioned something that you are helping uh, female empowerment. So can you uh, give us more insights about that particular uh, mission which you are uh, sure. working on? How yeah. that make have positive impact on the company? So I think um, women empowerment is, um, is relatively a new concept in, in this side of the world at least. Um, and, you know, um, whenever we use the word women empowerment, um, I have faced this personally. I've been looked as if I am a feminist uh, activist, you know, uh, and I think uh, it's a very, uh, it's, it's a misconception and, and very easily for people who um, are not well read and, um, you know, uh, are very, very secluded and have this narrow kind of thinking to, to really use that as, you know, uh, creating hatred or, you know, having that thought that, Oh, female or the feminist is going to take over the world. I don't, I don't believe that. I think we need a balance. It's always about creating that balance. You need the polarities of the feminine energy and the masculine energy in order to succeed, right? So what I do is I actually, um, I do a couple of things. Um, I volunteer as coach and mentor in a couple of um, women's circles. So I have been a mentor and, and coach uh, for Sheryl Sandberg's um, Lean In Circle in Kuala Lumpur. 
Uh, so I, I was mentoring and, and coaching um, women in, in the corporate scene to move up the ladders, as we know that there is always a shortage of women uh, leaders today in, in sitting and representing in boardrooms and all that. So I've, I've done that. Right now, I'm actually working with refugees. Uh, I'm actually the mentor and coach for the Somali uh, Women Business Women Association in Malaysia, which is such a privilege, I consider, to be able to mentor and, and coach this really thriving, driven, motivated, you know, bunch of, of women. And they are all out to, um, you know, to roar, you know, the girl power is like so strong, which is, which is so nice. Um, and the subsequently, you know, like with the platforms that I'm creating, like the Find Your Mojo retreats, um, I actually take uh, a small group of women wanting to keep it very intimate and, and personal. So we create this, this safe circle. Um, so between 10 to 15 women, uh, we would usually go away, you know, from base so that we can um, shut down or rather shut off from the world and really focus on um, self-care, self-love, right? So a couple of different themes. So the last one that I did in Bali very recently, uh, it was about the feminine empowerment for Shakti. So we, we wanted women to come together to embrace their feminine energy rather than shying away from it. So some of the topics uh, that we talked about was also um, today in Asia, we see that um, not many women want to talk about or rather address um, or have this, this open conversation about sexual desires, you know, about um, sexuality and how can they actually embrace their being in their own skin and, you know, and showing off uh, or rather um, being sensual, right? You know, how can they actually talk about it openly without having to like look over the shoulders or, you know, kind of feel awkward, you know, having that conversation. So these are some of the topics where I feel like there is not enough of work that is being done in these spaces. And hence, I want to help um, raise awareness and um, also really advocate to uh, continue the conversations, you know, and, and I also do a lot of talks around gender equality, you know, I think that's also very important. Um, and if you see with the Me Too movement, you know, um, which have uh, really probably, I think it was, it was good to a certain extent, but now when you look at the aftermath of, um, you know, of the driving force of, of Me Too, now we have uh, male leaders who are saying like, you know, I don't want to go out alone for dinner with my, my with my female employees, right? I mean, that's just literally stretching it and, and you know, uh, you're not really uh, adhering to the main objective of the Me, Me Too movement, right? Because they're so worried right now, in, you know, that the mind is uh, overpowered with um, harassment. I don't want to be, um, you know, charged for harassment or to be accused for harassment. And hence, let me just play it safe, right? And what the what the women you know are saying now is that because that has come about they are not given a fair chance to participate and to be themselves you see so again where do you strike that balance right because when you when you kind of really go all out and drive um you know um women empowerment initiative people tend to to think that we are male bashing that's not right we're not male bashing we want Harmony, literally, harmony, unity, and we want a nice, fine, healthy balance between the yin and yang. Uh, I encourage all women to contact you to, to create even a stronger community in Kuala Lumpur, in Malaysia, in that part of the world. And of course, we have uh, women from 60, uh, 66 countries at the moment. And I'm very proud uh, because we can really make a, a, a difference in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ed. It's, it's been such a pleasure and I feel really honored uh, to be on your community and, and on this platform. And I look forward to um, connecting more with the uh, women on this platform and to see how we can all uplift one another and, and create more impact uh, globally. Thank you very much for having me.